my man purchases Sea of Stars. He does not get the the downloadable version. I feel like this cartridge is a little bit hard to come by. And I happen to know that my friendly neighborhood, Target, had one in stock. So I scooped Ooh. it up. Stan, why are you purchasing Sea of Stars? Just want, you wanted to play through uh, a recent retro classic? Well, Shane and Dave. Shane and I were uh, on the phone yesterday for a long time because I was driving down from Wisconsin and I, I needed the company because otherwise I, I just do like bits at myself. Otherwise, he would never speak to me. Yeah. Otherwise, I just like burn out my throat trying to do new impressions. <laughs> I want to know what the old impressions are first. <laughs> They're not for the pod. Um, and uh, Shane and I were, were talking like, should we just start a video game podcast? And um, maybe what we'll do if starting a video game podcast is like do a, a, some test recordings through dive down channels. And um, we, we decided we would both try Sea of Stars for the Nintendo Switch and, and yeah, Steam. Yeah, there's very good reasons for that. And and record a podcast talking about it after. Oh, we you're just you're just putting it. us on the spot now. Now we got to do you it. You asked. You, you, <laughs> you showed it. You guys are you, starting a solo career. I mean, you you said me? you, you said you weren't interested. Um. <laughs> wow, I didn't think he's, things would escalate quite so quickly. But oh, now he's okay. changing his mind. No, now he I, changes his mind. That's how I changed my mind about the beginning of the podcast. Listen, I um. I look forward to being a fan of your video game podcast. I'm never going to have enough to say about video games, personally. So neither will I. I don't. I don't know. Stanislav, I'm. Uh, I, I, I guess I'll tee this up. I'm two hours and fifteen minutes through this game. Okay, so you better catch up, baby. I'll catch up this week. You know, I love to blow off work. <laughs> I do know that. Wow, I've never done that ever. No, I can't ever. imagine you doing it. Yeah. I have a hard time imagining you not working while work. I have a hard time taking my vacation time off when I say that I'm on vacation. Huh. Do you you're graphic designing in the in the forest while you're camping? I was definitely emailing people. Oh no. Coordinating, project managing. Yeah. It's gotta be a generational thing. Yeah, definitely. Dave Dave's Xer self versus my millennial self. You know, we just have different views on work. That that's thirteen months made a big difference. Yeah, in our in our drive, our dedication. Yeah, I'm fairly confident none of my colleagues have or will ever listen to an episode of my Magic the Gathering podcast. So maybe I tread lightly. But I, yeah, I love to. What I honestly do is like I procrastinate during the day and then I catch up at night, and kind of have been doing that since I was like 23, or and before that in high school. I think that's just kind of that's how I get stuff done i just like working on last minute diorama making you know what's even better is if you both work all day and also catch up at night oh that, that goes that goes great then we'd have no time to play sea of stars though true Hello and welcome to episode 288 of the Dive Down, a Magic the Gathering podcast focused on the latest decks, trends, and strategies for the casual spike. My name is Stanislav here at the Mars Cheese Castle. And mm. with me on the line from Denver, Colorado, it's the one and only Shane Beeps. Stanislav, hello. Yo. Welcome back. Welcome back from Wisconsin. Thanks. W what's that thing you were insisting i buy at the cheese castle mm, it's, wait, so wait. it's like a, it's a processed cheese spread ace of spades ace of spades baby it's all it's the only cheese you need i i get a bag of curds of raw curds i mean curds are fine you should get those too but the ace so the ace of spades it's just like a it's just a large it's it's what they serve at the bar like on the ritz is the ace of spades cheese spread You've sat at the bar of the Cheese Castle? Multiple times. Yeah. Oh, I get in and get out. Like, no, I have a, li a shopping list of my favorite mustards and cheeses and beers, and then I'm, like, hot to go. you have go. stuff on draft I want to eat? You get a bologna sandwich, right? If Like you a fried drink. fried meat sandwich? Yeah, I mean, I just sit there, I get, a, like, a beer or two, and I eat about 5,000 Ritz crackers. Speaking of Ritz crackers, we have the godfather of crackers, Dave Harbarger. <laughs> wow. 
speechless. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, Dave, you and I are both drinking our recently purchased from a visit to Wisconsin New Glarus Brewing Company beers. Which one are you drinking? I am drinking. My favorite one is Moon Man, which so is good. their sort of American style IPA. Mm -hmm. I'm trying yes. the Pilsner. I've never had the Pilsner. I have had the two women. That's a very good one. I have had uh, Road Slush and, of course, Spotted Cow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Road Slush is one of the best bottled stouts that I can think of. It doesn't have nitro or anything like that in it. It is quite good. You, you have to get the fruit, the fruited tarts. Oh, those are there. amazing. I don't yeah, like the, the Belgian red. Yes. The, 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 the mixed berry one. The, I like the, the apple ale. That's like sour and delicious. Yes. All, all of their fruit sours are good. Nucularis, get at us. Sponsor our podcast. One of my favorite places to visit. I think we've talked about that on the show before. The actual Nuglaris is a lovely place to uh, go camp. And then you kind of hike into the town and it's got like a Swiss theme to it. We took our Bernese with us last time. People didn't know how to behave. We brought him to his homeland. Of Wisconsin? The, your mountain dog is from the Great Plains of Wisconsin? Uh, more like, the I guess, the Disney version of his homeland. Right. That's cool. Did you stop in the Cheese Castle on your way back as well? I do not go to the Cheese Castle anymore because it is uh, kind of a price gouging, I think. Honestly, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's too right. expensive. You're probably right. So I'll grab it at other places more so than there though i've been many times thank you mars cheese castle for your service you know what i wish the mars cheese castle sold in addition to snacks beers cheeses and etc mm -hmm. mm -hmm. is it perhaps uh the finest gaming accessories that you can get to protect your uh change your gameplay and your game day i would love that i would love that so much they have it. It's Ace of Spades Cold Packed Cheese. Now, we've talked a lot about tournament prep on this show. You got to take your caffeinated, you got to take your bottles of water, your caffeinated cliff bars, but you also got to take Ace of Spades Cold Packed, cold packed Cheese with you. Uh, but also, you should take Heavy Play. Heavy Play is a card gaming accessories brand that will improve your gameplay and your game day. Their playmats, deck boxes, and card sleeves feature enhanced ergonomics, mobility, and protection. Heavy Play's unique Equip Mag system allows you to magnetically attach your deck and dice boxes, bundle decks together, and carry all your gaming gear in a single hand. We call it ABC, my friends. ABC will never let you down. So go and check it out at heavyplay.com. Use our code, the Dive Down 2024, for 10% off your first order. Heavy Play. Perfect. You guys, should we record an episode of the Dive Down? I suppose. You want to hear what this week's show's about? I got to say, I was camping and such this weekend, so I'm, I'm not entirely prepared for a primetime podcast such as we have, but I will do my best. Are you prepared for a conversation with your friends? Yeah, definitely. As long as it's not about Sea of Stars, my friends. I mean, I don't know if I want to have a conversation about Sea of Stars, but I'll save that for the alt podcast. Yeah. <laughs> If you, give us some names, Sam. So I was I was thinking about how about this one? Too many games. Is there already a podcast called Too Many Games? I don't know. I feel like maybe I'm just stealing that. I don't know. We'll Dave, my my recommendations was buttons and the ding dong. <laughs> <laughs> because you press buttons on a remote control, and ding dong is the sound that the video game makes. Oh, okay. And it sounds like a morning zoo show. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. I do like the shock jock aspect of it. It's me, I, Buttons. I can see where this brand is, is going already. <laughs> Quite different from our brand. We're the bad boys. All right, so here's what we're actually talking about this week. We've got a grab bag. Like so many of our episodes are, we've got another grab bag. We're kicking it old school for the longtime listeners of the show. We're starting with a brief breakdown of some of the weekend challenge results that I think may actually highlight one of the new rising strategies mm -hmm. in modern in the last week or so. Excited to chat about that. It's it's not a new deck per se, but it's one that we really haven't talked about in a long time. And an old friend exactly. is making waves yet again. Then we'll touch on a couple quick level up topics around scooping and mulliganing and magic just some things that i've had on my mind that i want to present to the two of you and get your unfiltered reactions well, good thing you came to buttons and the ding dong for your 
for your unfiltered takes. Then we wrap up the show with a brief visit from our friend of the pod, who's never been on the pod before, and a co-host from MTG Grindcast, Lee McLeod. He and I recorded a conversation about Nadu loops in Modern. For the people who maybe they're trying the deck themselves or they want to understand what opponents are doing when someone claims to present the combo in a game of Modern, we talk about how to execute the loops, when it's actually appropriate to scoop, what's deterministic, what isn't, and try to impart some knowledge about the current modern metagame, at least until the next BNR, if not more than that later. And then, if we have time, amongst all these short segments, I have a little game that I would like to play. Would you like to play a game? Oh, so I was just talking about Saw 1 and how my wife has not seen it. And I was like, Saw 1's actually pretty good. We should, we should watch Saw 1. I insist that we make time for this game. You've been, you've been teasing this game at us for like a month or two. Well, it's been three weeks. Yes, three or four weeks. It's not the most innovative game, but I do think it's, it's an interesting time for, some, for this particular one. So, But before we get to all that, let's housekeep. Although we have no new patrons or reviews this week that I could find, I don't check Spotify. So you, you'll have to interrupt me and chime in if there's anything of note on Spotify. Uh, we have nice comments on Spotify from a number of different people who we appreciate their interactions on that platform. Uh, we have Meow Guy and a couple <laughs> other people. Did Meow Guy just say Meow? Meow Guy did just say Meow. Okay. Uh, we had David Jones, who we spoke about last time, who was on a Mardu list with Mockingbird. I love their work with the monkeys. Yeah. So yeah. good. But also, they, they came in and said, yeah, it was fun to play and was for the content. I, I love it. Uh, we had Kimchi Cat, who said, I thought I was a Meow Guy. We have uh, another person who says, glad to be the... Or we have Alex, who is the Meow Guy, saying, glad to be the Meow Guy. We got a lot of people commenting over in Spotify. You should definitely go there and comment on this episode as well. If you'd like to support the show, you can check us out on Patreon, patreon.com slash the dive down. We've got a store on the dive down.com. We got a mana trader subscription promotion. Find the latest code in the show notes. Heck, you can even save some money at Nerd Rage Gaming. We don't get a cut off of that, but you can save 8% off with promo code DIVE8 at NRG. I want to get into this breakdown. We haven't done like one of these three X structures in such a long time. Shane, mm. you looked at weekend results. I did, I I did wondered, the thing again. I honestly wondered what you meant by kicking it old school, and I forgot about the original intent of the Dive Down television, or <laughs> the Dive Down television <laughs> show, the Dive Down podcast, which was three segments each week, an event or several, some kind of discussion topic, and then a little fun at the end. Breakdown, dive down, wind down. Yeah, forgot. Fist bump, push up, chapstick. Yeah. Burpees. Uh, Head, shoulders, day, knees, and toes. Something. All right. Shane, what'd you look at? Same stuff, different week. Well, meaning in terms of what I looked at, right? The, the, thing, the reason that I actually was interested in doing this again, even though I feel like we literally just did this last week, right? Is I think that there were, were some interesting results that are worth talking about. And so there's like a zillion challenges each week now. I think there are six. I think there's like two during the week and then two each weekend day, which makes for a lot of data. And uh, I, I wanted to call out one of the Saturday challenges. And there's some cool decks here. And the top 32 breakdown, uh, Bam Zang, thank you for saving me some time on this one. A little more traditional. We have 10 energy decks, five Boros, four Mardu, one Jeskai, four Jeskai Control, two Teamer Breach Grinding Station, two uh, Gruel Through the Breach, two Gorio's Vengeance, two Mill, two uh, Gruel Eldrazi Ramp, which is a deck I think we've mentioned. It's a deck that uh, a friend of the show, Zanman, has been uh, doing a lot of work with. Couple Storm, Couple Band, Nadu, even classic Murktide Creativity Tron and Lotus Field. So our top eight is Nyctophobia, 
on through the breach. You're going to have to be patient. We're going to talk more about this deck a little bit in detail later. Jake, the Mind Sculptor, TMS, on Jet Sky Control. Alakai on Grinding Nadu. Tio mm -hmm. Church on Mardu Energy. O Daniel Ekos, I know that name for sure from past results, on what appears to be bone stock, is it Merktide? Pre-MH3 Merktide. <laughs> yes. I, I think there's like a couple... I think there's like, you know, the that blue counter spelly type thing in the sideboard. Uh, That's consigned really to memory. Yes. Yeah, we could talk about it later, but... And then 16 Tone Ladas on Creativity. So yes, Creativity is making a bit of a comeback. More on that later. And 7th place, Vince... MTG Vince on Jeskai Control, and then DDRD on Corio's Vengeance. So that's it. I just wanted to kind of breeze through that, talk about the decks that did well here, and kind of drop some hints at some stuff we can talk about. Uh, I forgot who even won this one. It looks like it's on uh, Goldfish. Oh, it oh, says it's Daniel Like Yes, Daniel it was Lycos exactly. That, that, that's, that's the important thing. That's really one reason I wanted to call this out, is that, yeah, oh, Daniel Lycos, uh just won the whole thing with Is It Murtide. So uh, perhaps even a stock clock can tell the right time twice a day. Oh, Daniel Lycos knows what the heck they're doing with Is It Murtide, or play what you like, and you can still win a modern challenge. Or all three. Then I wanted to talk about one of the Sunday challenges. Another challenge, another challenge won by Young Dingo on Boros Energy. Oh. But, but I thought this was an interesting challenge nonetheless because it had a pretty wide meta in this top 32. So we only had four Boros Energy along with a Singleton Mardu and another Jeskai Energy. Three through the breach. <clears throat> Three Eldrazi Tron, two Demir Frog, two, De two Bant Nadu, two Jeskai Control, two Ruby Storm, and then 14 one ofs, including decks like Creativity, Coffers, Necrodominance, Titan, Gorio's Vengeance, etc. So the top eight had some interesting things going on here and there as well. So first we had Young Dingo on Boros Energy. Dingo was running the Singleton Goblin Bombardment, as well as a Singleton Bone Crusher in the main, I'm guessing, for Ring Tech. Uh, he was down to three Galvanic Discharge, because uh, that's pretty much been stock four, as far as I'm concerned, right? Mostly, yeah. Okay. I, I think he's making room for the fourth Flage. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Because Got he, went, from somehow. he went from three to four there. Four. And then uh, interesting sideboard option of End the Festivities, which is a single red mana sorcery. It deals one damage to each opponent, each creature, and Planeswalker they control. Probably decent in the mirror to clean up some Ocelot Pride tokens. Yes. I, I think it could also sweep up a bunch of cheeky insect tokens from a Nadu player who passes the turn. Seems fair. And then someone who's not me called out something I missed, two One Rings in the sideboard. Yes, I would like to mention, I don't know if you're going to talk about this more later, but there was a another person who posted a deck list it was on Twitter with four one rings main in Boros energy as well, which I was like, okay, now we're, now we're really doing it. So, mm -hmm. you know, what we, some of what we have feared has maybe come to pass. It's, it's, it's the Okoization of the one ring. Yeah. I, I wonder if that's someone's just trying to stick it to R and D be like, do it. You filthy animals, you know, you want to ban this card. Um, can I mention by the way, that there's a Ruby storm deck in this top eight, as you said, Shane, and it also has a one ring in it, in the sideboard. Why not? Why not, indeed. Buy yourself some time, draw some cards, I guess. Dave, can I borrow your one rings, or did you buy list them already? <laughs> I'm, I'm seriously thinking about doing it, like, tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. It's, it stinks that, like, the decks I really want to play are just, like, these Eldrazi, Eldrazi Tron-style decks, and they don't exist without the one ring, so I'm kind of in a rock in a hard place type situation, but I don't, I'm not really. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, am I really, are they really going to go up? <laughs> Probably. Who knows? I doubt they're going to go down. That's the problem. Uh, second place, Frank's EOT on creativity. So, a uh, Fanks EOT, excuse me. So, Fanks is running four of Paw Patch Formation from Bloomboro, which is 
A card that Stan played against me last night in my kitchen when no. we were playing literal kitchen table magic, uh, sealed. And yes, this is what it does. It's an instant. It's a generic and a green, and it says choose one, destroy target creature with flying, destroy target enchantment, or draw a card and create a food token. That's pretty good, I think, for creativity. It's it's interesting mm -hmm. to see, get to fit a little bit of sideboard card magic in here, but also just cycle, make a token is pretty good. And draw into a combo piece especially as well. Yeah. yeah. Does it all. It's sweet. Besides that, it looks like creativity to me. Third place is Manny on Jeskai Energy. So Jeskai Energy, pretty clearly an offshoot of the Boros decks, but what it features differently is for Mockingbirds, and this build has three Phantasmal Image, as well as a few consigned to memory in the board. So obviously, cheap clone effects allow you to duplicate important pieces on your battlefield. And what's more important than Ocelot Pride? Which is what I assume Manny is trying to do with <laughs> yeah. all of these things, is copy Ocelot Pride as much as possible to make as many tokens as possible to do some of the stuff that Young Dinko was talking about when he was on. Go, go Ocelots. And so what Manny's running 29 creatures versus the 24 that's typically seen, I think, in like Boros or Mardu decks. So shaving a little bit on things like Bolt, Fable of the Mirror Breaker, Blood Moon here. So just basically saying, uh, this is a creature deck and I'm going to beat you with even more access to creatures with my you know seven clone effects. I was going to say one more thing about the main deck here is that Manny's also running three Ranger Captain of Eos. Yes. Which yes. which ever was playing around with going to search up Mockingbird to copy Ranger Captain of Eos to do that multiple times or to just go search up Mockingbird and copy something else. It's a pretty powerful card as part of this package. Interesting to see it in this shell instead of just a bit more of a trolley one. Yeah, there's another deck I have in a later section that features Ranger Captain of Eos as well. So I'm excited to talk about potential applications for this card that have previously potentially been overlooked. Um, what's interesting, Manny also had two Sunspine links in the board. That new four mana Bloombrow life gain and damage prevention prevention card. Uh, so cool. Maybe Manny liked it. I don't know. Probably maybe testing it. But I know that uh, when Dingo was on, Dingo was saying they weren't super high on it. But maybe after testing, it's better than expected. Who knows? Uh, then we have some normal stuff. Gazmon 48 on Mardu Energy. Ozzy 51 on Bant Nadu. Got some senior citizens in here. Uh, Medvedev on Through the Breach, which we'll talk about again. Um, Pur Urin on Ruby Storm. And Zoza on Through the Breach. So yes, that's two Through the Breach players in the top eight of this tournament alone. And as I mentioned before, Young Dingo won the whole thing. So, one, congratulations, Young Dingo, friend of the pod. Keep winning those challenges. But a question I have for you, my friends, is this the return of Through the Breach? And I guess did it really go anywhere? It's been around. But th it, this had sixth, eighth, and ninth place in this challenge. So pretty good. And if you're not familiar with this deck, my friends, it, this particular build does one thing, which is ramp to Through the Breach and cast an Ulamog the Defiler or Emrakul the Aeon Storm. And hopefully do enough damage to the opponent to and all their existing permanents with all those Annihilator triggers to win the game. I would maybe posit that this deck does many mid-rangey things and just wins with the Through the Breach. Because I think if you're playing the One Ring, All is Dust, and Kozilex Command, and Sewing Microspawn, I think you, you've got like some slow interaction to get you to a big endgame finish. Well, exactly. Yeah, like this, this, this ramps and it interacts a little bit, right? And so, like the ramp is in uh, Talisman of Impulse, Kozilek's Command to get you those spawn tokens, uh, which also is an interaction spell, of course. And sowing Micro Spawn, I guess, if you want to call that ramp, it does cost three and a green. Um, and then, of course, it has access to Ugin's Labyrinth to speed up your through the breach by the turn uh, by a turn. And Ancient Stirrings is there to help you find a Talisman, a One Ring, All is Dust, one of your legendary Eldrazi's. Yeah, and Kozilek's Command also does look at a bunch of, you know, Scry 15, draw a card yeah, or whatever exactly. it is. So you can't, you know, there's no Tron lands in here, but you can still do a big, 
a big scry to be able to find something at the oh, end yeah. of your opponent's turn and then try to get one of your combo. You know, this is, you know, if this is an A plus B combo kill, you have, you need ways to get to the the pieces, right? And so we have mm -hmm. those in a few different ways. So a Micah spawn lets you continue trying to ramp, I suppose, or go to get additional Aldrazi temples or Cavern of Souls if you want. Have you guys not had this card cast against you and kicked? Sewing micro spawn, yeah, oh, yeah, it's great. it's it's rough. <laughs> it's brutal. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not gonna get kicked as much in this deck, I don't think, as it does in like the Tron Drazi builds. But um, still, it is brutal. And like you said, Stan, like you're really trying to keep the game under like some kind of control. Uh, with like Cosmic's command, all is dust, and then I just you know you're gonna hopefully when with through the breach. What's interesting is like Ulamog the Defiler, I believe, is a ten ten, seven uh, seven, seven seven, right? Which is like not that ridiculous of a card. Well, it's a seven seven, but it does yes, the thing where yes. it enters the battlefield with a number of counters equal to the greatest value among cards in exile, yeah, and you like and you exile half their library or something like that, correct? right? And, yes, and also you can. It's in exile anywhere, so you can. It can be cards that are exiled with like uh, Ugin's Labyrinth, for example. Yeah. So it comes down pretty tough, and Emrakul is going to come down pretty tough. I mean, what's what I'm curious about is like how often are you not winning with a through the breach Emrakul? Like, I guess you're doing so much damage to like their permanence and their life total that hopefully it's enough. But I'm I'm always curious like at what point is Emrakul not going to win? with haste, but because I guess it gets sacrificed at end of turn, but probably not that often. The sideboard here, I think is pretty dang focused. There's like four cards, um, just in different amounts. Like there's Kozilek's return for the creature decks. There's stone brain for, I guess like single win con decks like Nadu, which all, doesn't always win, um, living end, things like that. Vexing bobble is a card that I'm a bit confused about. Like it's clear what it does, but I'm not sure like what it's hating out in this meta. Like there's living end, there are some elementals, but I don't know like how much how much damage is vexing bobble doing to decks that it fears. Any thoughts there? Yeah, who knows? So so I have one thought, and that is running up against random decks that have um have force negation in mm -hmm. them because mm -hmm. this counters force negation and maybe even less flare of denial which you know has come up a little bit lately in a couple <laughs> a couple of weird decks yeah um but yeah okay and then we have run a fall for which is like a i think opponent sacrifices a creature with flying uh it's you know i'm guessing nadu are kind of cruelty and maybe the mirror you know opposing emeralds it's a good way to kill an emerald yeah i was just going to throw other one other thing out about vaccine bubble too uh, solitude. So Emrakul does not have protection from Solitude, right? Because it has protection from spells that are one or more colors, but it's not trigger mm. abilities or triggers mm. that are one or more. Mm. So it's, you know, you, this keeps you from getting Solituded too. Smart. Cool. So yeah, Through the Breach, doing well. Um, I think these are the types of strategies that make a little bit of sense to me, right? When like, if you can buy enough time and just do something that's really big, against kind of like these creature engine decks and maybe that's enough i just like that it's doing like something something a little bit novel in the metagame right now yeah it makes me wonder a little bit if for all is dust plus the one ring plus a proactive combo ish, -ish plan is decent against nadu maybe like you said because you're you're wrathing them and then if you play your win con it makes them sacrifice a bunch of permanents so you, if you don't even kill them they have to get rid of some stuff Although usually it's a bunch of insect tokens. So I, I don't know. I'd be curious to see. Exactly. There's also a gentleman's agreement of play as little Nato as possible online. So seems to be sometimes, yes. Yeah. All right. So through the breach was interesting here. Yeah. What what else is going on? I found some cool decks, ink, in the Sunday challenge specifically. We had the eleventh place deck was fictional adults coffers deck which features two Rotten Mouth Viper. So yes, Rotten Mouth Viper sighting. Yeah. In, in a deck that I don't think supports it particularly well, which I find no. interesting. Uh, so I'm curious, like, just how well they were using Rotten Mouth Viper. Maybe it's just kind of like an eventual win con. Can I tell you one thing that is probably a secret fun thing with Rotten Mouth Viper here? Mm -hmm. Do you guys ever know, heard of a card called Despotic Scepter? No. That was in Ice Ages. 
that uh, is tapped, sacrifice a permanent. No. Uh, you used to play it in your Necro decks sometimes. This is a deck that has the One Ring and Necro Dominance in it, and now has a permanent in it that lets you sacrifice any permanent that you want mm. to make the casting cost lower. So I, I don't know if it supports getting it out early, but it might be that this is a little escape hatch for a One Ring that has too many counters on it, or when you're tired okay. of Necro Dominance. Yeah, that's a good idea. Do not mind it. Um, but this is basically like a mono black control deck like Coffers usually is. But I think there's a lot of interesting inclusions in this deck that I haven't seen in previous Coffers decks. There's three extra pates, which I think piggybacks nicely off of like the Thoughtseize IOK package because extra pate basically has split second and you get to choose a target card in a graveyard other than a basic land and then just scrub through your opponent's hand, library, graveyard and get rid of that. So a nice way to get rid of you know, very specific win cons. And in this day and age, there are definitely a few, you know, maybe you get rid of some flages or you get rid of some Nadus or living ends or, you know, Emrakuls even, I'm sure would not be great to have taken away from you. Besides that, it also has four consuming corruption. I have been seeing a couple consuming corruption in other uh, coffers decks. That's the MH3 black black instant that deals X damage to target creature or planeswalker and you gain that much life or X is the number of swamps you control. Makes good sense in a coffers deck. Two force of despair, a card we knew would have you know some application at some point. So way to go force of despair. And then two damnation, uh, you know, classic wrath that doesn't see a lot of play in modern much anymore, but makes sense in this deck, I think. So I thought that was pretty sweet. Yeah, this is a very cool coffers list, definitely. And then something that I I feel like we've mentioned, but maybe not talked about enough, um, is this screenwriter NY it set 22nd place in Sunday's challenge with a five color energy deck. And this has callbacks even back to Aether Revolt with a card called Greenbelt Rampager, which is a green 3-4 that forces you to pay two energy for it to stick to the battlefield, or it generates one energy and then returns back to your hand. So this synergizes nicely with the Dower Port Mage, or Dower Port Mage, which is a one in the blue, one three from Bloomborough. It draws you a card whenever one or more creatures you control leaves the battlefield without dying. More on this in a second. So we've got Imperial Recruiter, we've got Ranger Captain of Aos, we've got Orcish Barmasters, we've got Amped Raptor, we have a single six, because why not? A three Solar Transformers, a, a card I honestly forgot existed. It's a two mana artifact from MH3 at ETB's tapped. What's, you know what's great about this card, my friends? This card does not say when Solar Transformer enters. Is that only for creatures? This says when mm. it enters the battlefield. Maybe a little bit of a editing yeah. mistake there. Uh, so it gives yeah. you three energy and can be then tapped for colorless or any color you can pay in energy when you tap it. I, I think that templating happened with Bloomborough. No, no, that's that's before that, I believe. Maybe I'm wrong. It might be Bloomborough, Stan. Oh, yeah. maybe, I'm just, maybe I remember the announcement in uh, at the uh, MagicCon, and it just kind of stuck with me. What's weird, though, is there's only two Aether Hub in this five-color deck that wants energy. I just can't imagine why you wouldn't play four, but they, they, they went 22nd. I did not. So here's the thing about this deck, though, is there is a Singleton Thassa's Oracle. And I believe the combo here is a Dowerport Mage Loop with Primal Prayers out. So you cast the Greenbelt Rampager with energy from your Primal Prayers, or you could cast it for normal, right? Then it, you bounce it back to your hand rather than pay the two energy. And then you get the free energy from Green Pelt Rampager, and then you draw a card with the Port Mage's effect. You can then do this over and over and over again, because you have the free energy from the uh, Rampager, and then you use that energy to recast it because it's a single green mana. Then you can just draw through your whole deck. And so then you can use the Imperial Recruiter or the Ranger Captain of Aos to like tutor that Green Pelt Rampager to your hand when required, and then go to town, I think is kind of how this deck has a combo finish. Yes. Yeah, I think that's how it works. I will point out one thing, and, and that is we've talked about, we talked about this on the, the spoiler episodes with this, that Greenbelt Rampager's pay two energy is not a uh, you may ability. It's you must pay two energy. And so maybe one of the what? reasons we don't have Aether Hub is because oh, you, you don't, don't want more want than like energy. one. 
Right. You only want a certain amount of energy around when you start the combo. Okay. So yeah, you have galvanic discharge to help you pay whatever amount of energy you want to. Like that's a good way to, you know, spend through your energy. Yes, yeah, so that's a, that's interesting. Yeah, so I think you have to manage it. Like managing the energy becomes part of what you have to do with this. Yeah. Cuz you also get two when you play primal prayers. Yeah, you do. And so, um, you know, there there's there's a lot there to work out. Yeah, the, the mana of this deck seems nightmarish. Like, just truly nightmarish. Like, it, it, like is Inquisition of Kozilek and Orcish Bowmasters, I guess the sideboard cards has Thoughtseize and Fatal Push. Like, is that really worth going spreading into black mana for? It must be, I guess. I don't know. It's a wild one. It's a wild deck. But they also got 27th on a challenge on uh, August 6th. So they're doing something with this. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad to see Dowerport Mage popping up. I think we kind of identified it as a combo piece potentially in the spoiler episode. So that's, that's fun to see somebody trying. Yeah, it's cool. I have one deck that Ooh. I would like to share that's not from a challenge, though, but it's kind of a, a build-on point of the decks that I talked about last week. Uh, if you have not seen Pygonti on Twitter last week, Pygonti has picked up the blue-red wizards kind of theme that I was talking about a little bit last week when we speculated about Sven Sveter Sven's list that had Arena of Glory plus Crackling Drake plus Thunder Trap Trainer plus Snapcaster Mage. Lots of ways to just do some cool stuff with this deck. It's Preordained, Spell Snare, Galvanic Discharge, Lightning Bolt, Tamiyo. Remember last week I mentioned, I don't understand why this deck doesn't have Tamiyo in it. Here's one that's trying it. Mm -hmm. Snapcaster Mage, Counterspell, Trainer, Iteration, Flame of Anor, some other cards, and then Crackling Drake. It looks like a very fun build. And Pyganti, former um, Murktide Master, has said that they've gone, they went 5-0, two leagues in a row with this deck, 10-0. Which Sweet. I thought was interesting, and maybe I might give it a try the next time I have some tickets to burn. Love it. If if Dave's not casting Crackling Drake, are we truly playing Magic? If Dave's not burning tickets, <laughs> is the deck really worth trying? It's true. He doesn't it's have true. to get his credit card out and purchase some more tickets. If he I just a... have all these cards except for Thunder Trap Trainer, and you can't convince me that that card has to be in this deck. But we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Okay, so fun breakdown. Yeah, I'm just, of, I'm just glad to see people doing some cool stuff, having some fun. Yeah, I mean, it's nice to see, like, shoots of things going on before whatever happens on August 26th happens. Um, obviously, there was, some, there was some one tournament there where there was a lot of energy and another one where there was a much more reasonable amount. And you know what? I think that's just the way, the way it is. I think the old school Dive Down listeners will know that this is where we at one point would put some bumper music, maybe even drop an ad read, and then move on to the dive down section. I guess we don't have any mid-episode ads to read, so we don't need the bumper music. We could just talk our way into the next section of the show. And it's a sort of a level up. Sort of a level up. I, I'm going to start with the one that I think maybe more people may have seen or been, par or been present for. Okay, I got to go back. I don't know. We can make this into a level up, but for me, I feel like we are are wading our feet into like Twitter discourse. Well, it's strategic discourse for sure, and and it's something that reminded me of conversations. Maybe we've never even had this conversation in public or private, but something that <laughs> where that, did we have the conversation then, Stan? Via our, our was, mind meld. Yeah, in, in, in my brain, watching Shane play magic and getting frustrated with it it was an implied conversation <laughs> it's when you're pacing around your apartment just like mad at someone and just having like a one-sided argument well what did i do wrong you scoop too soon shane hmm it depends hmm. more on this later that's the question in it someone on twitter uh by the name of stanley 2099 from the future no relation i don't know anything about stanley's comment content otherwise but I, I hope it doesn't get me in trouble. But Stanley tweeted something to the tune of, if you want to win more games of Magic, you should be scooping more matches. Or, or really more games. To win more matches, scoop more games. And mm -hmm. Stanley provided several anecdotes about 
going deep into a game two and drawing a hate piece too late and deciding to concede rather than convey information and possibly winning the match through decisions like that. And then I, I likewise saw a counterpoint from Karate Dom 10, who actually said, you should scoop less to win more. And I, I feel like this is clearly a pretty nuanced topic and very contextual based on games, decks, and formats. I wanted to bring it up to you guys because I am of the opinion that in modern, unless your opponent presents like a deterministic game state, you should know when they've won and you should scoop. And sometimes they've won because you're at one card, they have seven cards, they're the control deck, and like the game's not over, but they've effectively won. Or they've won because they have two Spring Heart Nantukos and a land. You know what I mean? Or they've won because they've actually killed you. But I feel like in more powerful formats... I have surprised myself often by sticking to a game and eking out a win because big swings happen with powerful cards. I feel like you're cutting to the chase a little bit, Stan. I, th I think we should perhaps talk about some reasons that you might scoop more and then reasons why you might scoop less mm -hmm. and then kind of hash these out a little bit because... Sure. I, oh, go ahead. Here's what I would suggest will at the I don't know, somehow we should say if we're buying or selling these reasons to scoop more or less sure. yes yeah. okay yeah. so examples from stanley's tweet in the future 2099 uh, they stated you can scoop to conceal information versus playing it to the board when it's too late that's like the sideboard hate piece that you gave an example of and you can scoop to conserve time in a matchup where it's likely hopeless and ensure you have a chance in future games of the match so I think that's a common one, right? That I've run into for sure, where it's like we're deep in game two versus like a slower control deck. I'm sort of hanging on by a thread, but it seems pretty hopeless and we've got 15 minutes left. So why make them kill you over four more turns with like their creature land or something like that? Just let's get it over with and give me time to hopefully get through game three or something like that. Okay, point by point, what do you guys think about these reasons? Scoop to conceal information. It, it d depends on a lot of things. But okay. all in, like, what do you think about this feeling? Your inter information has to be priceless. It depends on how far, how far behind you are. Like, I feel like, honestly, if you're too far behind, that playing a hate piece is going to lose you the game. You already are in a position where you're going to lose the game. Yes. So it's like, I feel so like... maybe it, you should have scooped the last turn. It feels yes. like it goes hand in hand with, like, the, honestly, the conserving time thing. Or just, I mean, concealing information is a good thing, right? There, there was an interesting counterpoint by a person by, that goes by the Blood Sower on Twitter, and they stated that conceding, conceding to conceal info is pretty overrated um, if you're playing a good opponent. And if you're not, you'll probably win anyway, in theory, is what they state. You should assume that they can anticipate your hate card anyway. I think that for the games that casual spikes like us are frequently playing, like we're not in the 10-3 bracket at the end of day two or something like that. You know what I mean? Like we play a lot of normal players like us. And like I'm not, I don't know the sideboard cards and hate pieces of every opponent i'm playing and that's saying they're playing like a 75 card stock deck or something like that you know what i mean uh i actually feel like you probably know i think you're giving yourself a little too little credit shane i mean we do we personally we do a breakdown of tournaments almost every week we look at deck lists almost every week and you know we're not good Scan's good. We're not good. Yeah, I guess, well, I guess what I'm saying you know is like, I mean? it's like, we're like, fine. Uh, yeah. So I, well, I guess what I'm saying is I'm not predicting my opponent's hate cards necessarily. And in, in as much as like, if they reveal it to me, sometimes it is a surprise, right? Especially if you're doing something a little bit spicy. Like, I think it's, it's potentially worthwhile to conceal information. Um, but again, I, my, my point still stands where it's like, if playing the hate pieces is still going to lose you the game, you're already too far behind. Yeah. Because modern I mean, hate I think pieces are powerful. It's a little tricky to where information and in, so much of, of the gameplay in modern 
I, I've mentioned this before on the show, but it's something I still think is true. The gameplay of Modern in a format where the number of turns that you actually get to play Magic is so compressed in yes. many games that you play is about implied information. It's not necessarily about, like, it's about meta information. So it's about being able to clock what deck your opponent is on by the land they play on the first turn. Yeah. Which is, you know, you can clock, what, 70% of decks that you're against by the land that they play on the first turn. You know, it's like knowing that kind of algorithm that you go through to be like, oh, someone just played a Spire Bluff Canal against me on turn one. What deck am I playing against? Well, it's probably Is It Prowess. <laughs> you know, like there's, you can make reasonable guesses about lo most of the decks in Modern that way. And then it, when you factor in the land they play on the first turn plus the card they play on the first turn, you will know pretty fast what deck you're up against and also what hate you're likely to see in subsequent games. Um, I think if you're someone who's reasonably studied and plays in the, in the, this much. So I, I'm not a big fan of that unless you're like very into my secret tech. And as we know, my secret tech is frequently fancy play syndrome. So it, it, you know, you better have really cracked through something if you're really doing that. I am, however, I can be a fan of, of scooping to protect information. If you just don't know want your opponent to know what decisions you made based on cards mm. that you played during gameplay. For example, if you don't want someone to know what you kept on top of your deck after surveilling, when you draw that card and you go like, oh, this card was good enough for me to keep in this situation, but I'm still going to die because of what they did on their turn. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that that is something that is reasonable to to scoop to protect. I, there are scenarios like that that I think are more about, again, the meta information of what decisions you make or the way that you approach playing the game that can be valuable to conceal via scooping and making the game restart. I still think that that's a pretty corner case and you need to be playing against somebody pretty good to even pick up on stuff like that. But it is the type of thing that I think about when I'm playing. Yeah, I mean, that's a good nuance, Dave. I have definitely done the, I have already mulled to five versus like, uh, scam and then they scam me turn one and it's game one and i'm just like i don't want you to know what i have like this game's gonna yeah. be this game's gonna be over you're on seven cards and you're scamming me and my chance to win this is going to be infinitesimal so i'm just out like i don't even want to let you know what i'm doing and you know what deck they're on and yes. they don't know what deck you're on yes in that case which makes going into game two more difficult I just feel like even in that specific scenario, you you should be playing a deck that can... I mean, I guess you're going down to three cards. Yeah, you're down to three cards. You're not winning. Yeah, you, yeah. I mean, it's it's you might be, but it's certainly something you can look at your hand and make the decision. But I... So I think that the thing that I would say about all of this is like sideboard cards, I don't think necessarily often qualify as information that needs to protected, be protected. But I do think there's more nuance into this like information you should try to protect about who you are as a player mm -hmm. that uh, can be important. Yeah. I, I guess j just to actually go back to this example of like getting scammed to three, like it's game one. That's assuming that game two, you get to play and against in the scam scenario, there's no guarantee that you're not getting scammed again. So if your chances are 0% or 10% to win, like, what difference does it make if you are denying yourself that 10% to win from three cards? Because, like, like Dave said, and, and this is not necessarily, like, lights out argument, right? But it's like, you have information they don't. So you can keep more scam-proof hands. Like, you, you will likely be more willing, like just like playing against any sort of Thoughtseize IOK type mid-range deck, is you have to maintain resources so you can keep looser hands that just have more assets, right? That's like one way to maybe approach it. Or perhaps you have, you know, very specific sideboard cards that can prevent them from hurting you that you can play on like turn zero or turn one or something like that and mulligan for those. I think the bigger thing is that they don't know that you're a bad, like in the case that you're a bad matchup for scam, they don't know that you're a bad matchup for scam if you scoop, right? So they can't bring in Blood Moon or mm -hmm. whatever the sideboard bullet is because they don't know. And maybe, maybe they take a shot. Maybe game two scam player goes, whew, this person scooped when I scam them. So I'm going to level them and go, I'm going to assume that they're on a deck that's weak to Blood Moon because of X, Y, and Z. And so I'm going to bring in Blood Moon. Like, they, you know, they can make a guess. Mm -hmm. 
and do that thing and do some sideboarding, but they won't know. And that that's the scenario that I think we're trying to outline. Yeah, you can, yeah, you bit. give them no ability to sideboard, so like their game their game two is weaker. You're on the play, um, which is you know of, of course very helpful in terms of just setting yourself up for potential success. So, you know, I I don't think it's like there's not a lot of situations like if you're getting turn one thoughts eased. Like I think that that's just a different scenario than like you know mulliganing to pretty low and then also getting like grief scammed or something like that. It's just it's a different kettle of fish, and. You know, it's not something you're going to do every time, but I think that there are particular hands that you're just like, well, I have two lands and and maybe it's the mirror. Like they take my feign death and they take my grief and I have got two lands left. Like this game's over, you know, basically over. Yeah. So I mean, maybe I don't want them to know that I like had the intestinal fortitude to sit there and represent that I had a counter spell for four hands where I had just <laughs> basic lands, you know what I mean? Where, you know what I mean? Where like I was flooding and so I have four lands in hand and they have, you know, like there's lots of things that you maybe don't want them to know about your game and your abilities when you get in that kind of spot. How about the next one? How about scooping to conserve time in a matchup where it's where you want to make sure, I mean, this seems like a slam dunk. This is yeah. something you should definitely think about when you're doing clock management in a tournament. Yes, and, and that's basically what I'm referring to when I talk about you're playing against control. You are technically alive. You have more than zero life, but you have zero to one cards, and they have seven. The time is a the clock is a resource there that it's better to leverage that than like thinking they're going to run their clock out in paper, which is not a thing. Right. It's very tough. So I don't think we have to talk about that one too much, but like, keep it in mind. Like you should definitely think, be aware of, you know, I'm not someone who tends to go to time in my matches, um, mostly because I am willing to scoop, but it happens. It's happened to me in sealed where I went to time in sealed and was like, whoa, if I had been locked in, in game one, a little bit more, I would have scooped and moved on. And that probably would have helped. I think that this is honestly the only real argument for conceding early, like even more than, you know, protecting hand information against like a scam opponent or something like that is is time management. Yeah, I mean, you're almost never conceding early in a game for clock management. Like this is still like I'm on turn 10 or turn 12 yeah, exactly. of, a, yeah. of a game. And you're just like, I don't want to go to turn 19 of this game. Like, let's move on. Right. And we're, I think, talking about game one and two in game three. Like, well, yeah. You're not managing a clock anymore. Yeah, there's two. There's two outs, man. You're doing. You're exactly. doing all of it when you're in game three. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. The last one. How about staying fresh, keeping your mentality good? Yeah, this is something that I actually saw. I, they said something along these lines, which is like, if I'm playing like a limited game and I know that like I've got to, you know, draw runner outs and it's like one in thirty and one in twenty nine odds. Like I'm going to sort of preserve my sanity like approach the game next game like fresh like it's not worth it to me to stick around which kind of surprises me in like a limited context especially because limited you don't know their stock deck you really don't know mm -hmm. yeah it's i i find it i i will say and this is something i think marshall has said on limited resources forever which is like don't scoop in in limited like i unless there's time going on like i gave the example of a minute ago where i'm like i gotta manage my clock because it's an rcq but if i'm playing it like i'm not scooping in limited who knows what's going to happen i might top deck my bomb i might forget a card an application of a card that i have in my deck that can do something in a very specific case uh, i think in this scenario in constructed i think it's much more especially for me and you know i know that so I have some problems playing paper, I think, where I get like extra tilted because I don't play paper as much as many players do. I feel more comfortable playing magic at my house. Like I get a little overwhelmed in like a tournament space and get like distracted. So for me, I think it is good sometimes for me to just pull a shoot and go on to the next round so mm -hmm. that I'm like still in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I think that's up to like the individual person, but I can see a lot of benefits to it. Yeah, my mental fortitude, honestly, in playing a lot of magic wears down pretty quickly because I don't have like the reps and I don't do the exercise, you know, mental exercise of playing a ton. So like if I feel myself being disengaged with a game, it's like just as bad as if I'm not playing it. So it's like, I think it's like an endurance thing. Right. And you can, you can try to work on that. Or if like, you know that your endurance is failing, then maybe you do have to, you know, like you said, pull the shoot a little bit early and get there fresh if you're running on fumes at the time. 
Okay. So that's why to scoop more. Yeah. Why concede less, Stanislav? I feel like this is this is this is something that I mean. I think we all think you should probably concede less, but um, this is probably I think something that you are are more more interested in talking about. I mean, only because we're playing par- like I said, we're playing powerful formats where you can have a big turn if you draw the right card, and that one card could be Flage in today's modern, or it can be Shardless Agent in yesterday's modern, or Grief and. I guess any modern. I don't think that's scooping early though. Like if you have like an out, like a cascade card, you know what I mean? If you have like eight of those in your deck and that's going to get you back into it. Like, I don't think anyone's conceding in that situation where drawing into that card is good. Right. But I think part of what Stan might be saying here though, is open yourself to the possibilities that what card you top deck may trigger a plan in you that you are not thinking of in advance. Mm -hmm. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? Like you have random, like it's a random game, you get random resources in your hand and you have to make the best, you have to improvise. And I think opening yourself to what that improvisation can lead to is an important aspect of playing magic for sure. And I think that gets into, I think, sort of a combination of two good reasons to not concede early. And one is you get the option to dig yourself out of that bad situation that feels hopeless, and you get the reps at doing so, right? Because honestly, the people that we are playing most often are going to be people like us who make mistakes. Like we are not playing against the best of the best in the top eight of the PT who these, you know, nearly infallible players, right? Like people make mistakes and by staying in that game, you get opportunities to capitalize on mistakes, to capitalize on windows that someone leaves open for you. I think, you know, this can happen with like even just things like combo decks where like your opponent's maybe not an expert at executing the combo and they could miss sequence or they could whiff on something that you think is guaranteed. Like I've seen some crazy whiffs against people I just didn't want to scoop against. Like, I'll make you kill me with this because I know you have the possibility. And then they do. And they have like three cards left in deck. And the third one was the one they needed. You know what I mean? Like that stuff happens. And like getting those reps is just really important. Like you're playing the game and you're learning as you're playing and you're staying engaged with the game in front of you. And like, even if you feel like that advantage bar is way on the other side, like you're going to learn something about like, you know, like maybe you turn a, 10% 10% or into a 25%er, but it's still 15% that you gained there. And that's not arbitrary. Like, you may, you know, it's, we're not being rotty here, right? We're, we are saying, like, just because we lost doesn't mean we actually lost. It just, like, we, we may have lost the game, but you're sort of getting that ability to know how to fight back a little bit better, perhaps. Yeah. Stan, what else crosses your mind when you're thinking about not scooping? I mean, actually seeing the cards in your opponent's deck. Like, if we're, especially if we're talking about post-board games, like, we, we talked about concealing information, but there's also the game of gathering information. And, like, if your opponent, let's say you're playing a game where graveyard hate matters against you, seeing the type of graveyard hate someone might cast against you is very valuable. I feel like if someone is already so ahead that you're considering considering scooping, if they're playing, like, additional, like, you know, just completely burying you cards and they're doing it wrong, right? Like if they're trying to turn like an 80%er into like a 100%er by like playing a particular piece of hate against you, like I think they're doing it wrong. But like at least it's good to know, right? Like let's say your opponent's like, I have one engineered explosives and I'm going to play the second one just as like insurance. And like mm-hmm. then you know they have two. But, but, well, I'm also thinking about the scenario where you're on living end and you don't know if your Boros opponent has... Um, the guide of souls or uh, unlicensed hearse, you know, and like depending on like, do you need to play against like the long activations of an unlicensed hearse, or do you need to worry about like one big graveyard hate turn from guide of souls and or surgical extraction, for example? Like, th- th- those are the kind of corner cases where your plan might change based on like the texture of the cards within a range of cards an opponent may cast against you post board especially i guess my only pushback there is like why are you scooping before they play those cards right meaning like if if you're already so far behind that you're considering scooping 
Like, w- are they going to play those? And so you know that they have them? Because games are different, Shane. Because anything can happen. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's true. That's true. All right. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I just, I, I'm still on the on the side where it's like, I think an opponent who's doing that, if they're already super far ahead, is like doing it wrong because, they, like you said, they're giving information, but then people make mistakes, like I said. So I think like all of these things come into play in games of magic. And I think people, I, I think fundamentally, like my, my only real message is like, people make mistakes, I make mistakes, and you can capitalize on those. And I think a big reason is you get the option for an unintentional draw. And I am not saying to slow play or work yourself towards a draw, but if but you get the option for one because a draw is one point and a loss is zero. So when you concede aggressively, right, like you're 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 trying to give yourself a chance to win a future game, right? Like you're saying, I need this time. But you're also giving your opponent that same time, right? Like your concession is not getting you free percentage points. And so if you think like the matchup is bad. Like, no one's forcing you to scoop. And you can just play normally and force your opponent to beat you fair and square if they have, like, some really mopey win con. And, you know, if it happens to go to a draw, then it happens to go to a draw, and you got one point instead of zero. And again, I think this is, like, potentially rocky terrain that I am treading on, but I think that it is a it's a realistic outcome for, like, a slow player playing a slow control deck or weird win con deck or something like that. So if you concede aggressively, you're a little more likely to get a zero than a one. All right. <laughs> no takes. They're going to leave me hanging out there for the, for the comments. No, I mean, I, I, I'm with you on that particular one. I do think all in, I'm in the concede less camp. But, I mean, what are we talking about? Like, it probably happens once out of every... It probably happens once out of every 10 games. I'll scoop, you know? Yeah. You know, the reason I even brought this up in the first place and why I thought it might be nice to chat about is because there's no prescriptive answer, though people on Twitter might try to provide it. But I think what we've also highlighted is there's different situations and considerations to keep in mind. And moving... Ending the game is one of your resources the clock mm-hmm. is one of your resources and and you can manage that potentially to your benefit yeah i totally agree here's another level up that i heard and i suspect this conversation will be much much shorter it was are you uh, sure it's us Dan. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i mean Pro- this is still us prove me wrong well it, it'll be shorter because someone else already had the convo i was listening to constructed criticism uh, Mason Clark, Abe Stein, they have a third co-host whose name is escaping me right now, but they're talking about something and they had a level up chat where Mason talked about when to mulligan more. And, and I think something that a lot of people come to learn over time is the value of the mulligan and when you should or should not mulligan more aggressively. I have one thing to say about this, and then okay. I'm going to listen. Okay. <laughs> and that is, I think mulliganing is like the most under-discussed, largest impact on people's games of magic mm-hmm. aspect of the game. Yes. I'm just going to say that. Sure, sure. Mason put it into a framework that I thought was revelatory for me, which was when you look at an opener of seven cards you need to have the highest possible standards for what that hand should look like. And if your very high standards for what that hand should look like can't fit the mold of that seven card opener, you go to six and lower your standards. And, and he used the analogy of, of dating. And I actually think that analogy falls apart really quickly as soon as you mulligan to six and, and lower your standards for a dating partner. But I, 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 just, I just thought... When I look at my opening sevens, I think about how to make use of a hand frequently. And like, if the hand is obviously bad or it's a hand you obviously could lose with, like, sure, you ship it. Like, maybe it's a hand with all three drops and you're playing in modern and it's like two lands and three drops. Like, that, that's a risky keep, even though it's lands and spells. But, but the framework of like, have high standards and then just lower your standards for subsequent mulligans. Like, I thought that was a really great actionable piece of advice for sure 
I think that's, I think that's, you know, thinking about it, that's how I approach it for sure. Right. Which is just like, you know, I'm down to six already. Is this good enough? Or is it, you know, is it better? Is it, you know, is it better than a five is going to look like, or a good five? I think it's kind of how you have to approach it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. I want to ask one thing before we leave the segment. How much do you think you mulligan all in? Stan. How, how, what? How frequently do you think you mulligan all in in modern? Like, are we talking about like does one that out include, of five times? Does that include unkeepable hands? Like, I, I, yes. I, I don't know how to answer that question. I would say, like, what do you think the all in number is for how often you mulligan a seven? You see, 35, 40%. 40%. Wow. I was going to say, I think mine's probably around 25%. 40% is interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I feel like I'm. Do you think you're in that zone? I, I, I think, especially with the decks I like to play, usually they have like certain, more certain components that I want to see in my opener. So, yeah, there's a lot of mulliganing. It's, yeah. it's, it's definitely less than half. 40% is probably. I would hope it's less than half. <laughs> yeah, 40% is probably. Seems like it would be a, 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 badly deck, a badly built deck if you have to mulligan more than half your hands. So, I think I'm one out of four. You guys are kind of telling me you think you're one out of three. Perhaps. Nah. Nah, nah, nah. One out of four, one out of five. I, yeah. should, I should keep track. All right. Just curious what your baselines were. Okay. So, Stan, we have a drop-in. Yes. Yes. You want to know For what more happened? strategic advice. Yeah. I listen to a lot of magic podcasts, and um, I, I explained this in more detail during the drop-in itself, but I was listening to the most recent episode of Grindcast, and they almost talked about Nadu loops and then decided not to. And Lee was like, just reach out to me if you want to hear about Nadu loops. And I wanted to learn about Nadu loops. So I reached out to Lee and Lee's like, sure, I'll, I'll tell you about Nadu loops. And I was like, can we record this for my podcast, which will eat your sloppy seconds without <laughs> hesitation? <laughs> we don't know what the episode's about yet, but I would love to just record a segment because I think it could be valuable. We put it together. We're dropping it in. I hope you like it. I learned a lot about it. Lee goes into pretty great detail about the cards that matter in games of Nadu. And I think it might help you understand your role if you're trying Nadu. And I think it'll understand what's happening across the table if you're playing against them. And I hope you enjoy it. Sweet. Hey, Lee. Hey, Stan. What's going on? Not much. It's nice to have you all the way from the land of MTG Grindcast. Yeah, you've had Chris on multiple times now, but this is my it's my first little foray. I know, I know. And I'm excited to have you on today for a, a very special segment that I'm going to call Learning Loops with Lee. <laughs> Alliteration. <laughs> and it, here's really what happened for... The people who don't listen to Grindcast, you should, because it is your favorite magic podcaster's favorite magic podcast, assuming in this case that I'm your favorite magic podcaster. And on the most recent episode, you guys were talking about a bunch of stuff, um, including when is it appropriate to scoop in the Nadu matchup? And one of the things that came up was the importance of understanding the Nadu loops whether you're a Nadu player, just to know what you're doing and can represent it accurately, but also if you're playing against Nadu to ensure that your opponent is representing loops and the board state accurately, and maybe as a shortcut for yourself, when to concede because the win is deterministic. And then Chris suggested you guys go through the loops and you were this close to doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and then Lee was like, nah, that's boring. I don't want to do that. But if anybody wants to learn the loops, just reach out to me on the internet and I will teach them to you. Yeah, you, you took me up like immediately, which was surprising. <laughs> I mean, I knew someone would. That's why I said it. Yeah, I'm willing to do it. That's why I'm here. But Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm also willing to use Grindcast Scraps as content for the Yeah, idea. of course. I mean, our, our last episode was pretty rambly because we were just unsure what to do with all of the the magic right now There's a lot of weird stuff going on so i didn't want to like bog our crazy informal episode down with a bunch of highly technical who's even playing modern right now kind of deal but i'm happy to do it in the like focus segment that's you know that's the jam uh, yeah I'm, I'm excited to learn from you 
So we have a Nadu list before us, and we will add a link to the show notes so you can take a look as well. Um, but my understanding, as someone who has barely played Nadu, and so yeah, I guess like I played it for a day or two when the deck first broke, just for the sake of being a modern podcaster. Mm -hmm. But like I barely play against it, um, and when I play against it online, often. I'm against someone who's like doing Thassa's Oracle as a win condition, but I guess that's not the norm in paper. Yeah, in online, you cannot, it is just not feasible to do the loops, the, the Waterlogged Grove Endurance type loops, where you're just like going through your deck multiple times and you eventually win. It, it, that's just not feasible for like the way Moto uses the clock uh, and you can't shortcut anything, right? In paper, that's not true. You can just say you're going to do something x number of times and it just happens you don't have to like manually go through it so in paper you would not play a thousand's oracle you would just do your looping stuff uh though if you don't want to deal with the looping stuff which is honestly valid because this deck's only legal for a few more weeks just play a thousand's oracle that would be okay uh, that's not really why we're here i'm here to talk about the loops not get rid of them <laughs> but online yeah. you're not really going to see uh, a lot of these lists just cut the Waterlogged Grove entirely because it's not very good land. Uh, and so you won't see Waterlogged Grove in a lot of these lists because they're not trying to loop the, the channel lands with Endurance to run your opponent other stuff. Basically, they're just winning with Hostiles Oracle or uh, Finale of Devastation is the other one. And that's because Finale just makes a ton of mana and gives your stuff. It pumps yourself and gives them haste. Yeah, it's really easy to make a lot of mana online, even if you can't do the full loop. Uh, and then you just cast Finale for X's whatever and put a giant creature into play and they it gives all your creatures haste or so you can attack with whatever you have left as well you can also cast that finale a lot of times if you want to because you can keep endurance it to the bottom of your library and keep drawing it mm -hmm. but no one really makes you play that out even online because once they see the finale you're like oh, okay this person's just gonna kill me and you know an attack <laughs> right on and even though i think you're right nadu is probably going to get banned uh, during the next BNR cycle, there's still some weeks of RCQs. I will be playing in an RCQ on Saturday, and mm -hmm. I just want—I just want to make sure I'm prepared, and I want to make sure our friends and fans are prepared as well. No, absolutely. So, what do you think is the most common loop? Like, where where would you start for someone who <laughs> hasn't played against or really watched this deck operate? At I'm going to go super, super duper basic, just because I'm explaining something to a podcast. Uh, the first time I actually wrote out this wrote out this loop for uh, one of my friends who was asking like how does Nadu work, uh, I did like a step one through X or whatever, and my step one was have infinite mana, and they're like whoa 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 hold on hold on you <laughs> you you skipped something, <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of how like complex it can get is where your starting point is just you've you've already got infinite mana just you know trust me. The, the way Nadu works uh, at a baseline level, you equip a Shuko to, or Outrider and Core or whatever, you target a creature with Nadu in play, uh, and you try to flip up a land into play, or you put a card in your hand. If you have Springheart and Tuko into play, every land you hit makes an insect, which is two more triggers for Nadu if you have a Shuko in play. So the, the trick with Nadu is to get the Nadu Shuko going and then have a Springheart and Tuko in play to reduce your whiffs because you can't afford to spend mana on creatures to often like get more activation of the Shuko. You can for a little bit, but not always. Uh, and you kind of just win the game when you have two Springheart and two goes in play, or, or bestowed, it doesn't really matter how they're in play, uh, because every land you hit is then four Shuko triggers, and you're just... I've never missed once I've had two Springheart and two goes in play. It just like, doesn't happen. Because every land you hit is two bugs, four Shuko triggers, then that's going to get you a land. You just go through the whole deck. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the you've got two Sprankheart and two goes in play, you're going through your deck. That's kind of where I'm starting this scenario. So when you're going through your deck, you want to be looking at basically two cards. You're going to need a Sylvan Safekeeper somewhere. That allows you to sacrifice your lands. Uh, you're going to want an Endurance, which will let you shuffle your cards back. Uh, Yavimaya, the land, that'll let all your fetch lands you hit along the way tap for green mana. So that gives you a little extra mana boost. That way you don't have to you know, keep sacrificing them because you can just tap them for mana and sacrifice them to still have a good. 
Uh, and once you get low on cards, you can Endurance to put, uh, with Sylvan Safekeeper, sacrifice a bunch of lands and Endurance those lands back into your library and keep going. Mm -hmm. the, Making just tons and tons of bugs. Tons of bugs and tons of mana because uh, once you're Endurancing lands into your library, you make as many bugs as you can. And all those lands tap for mana because Nader doesn't let them come into play tapped or anything. You just tap those things for mana. It's on the house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and eventually you will bestow, when you have enough mana, you will bestow an Antuco onto the Endurance. So that way when you make land drops, uh, landfall triggers, you can copy the Endurance to shuffle more lands in your deck. And that's how you get infinite mana. You just keep, you eventually have a place where you have endurance in play bestowed upon with a Intuco, uh, and you can create so many you can sacrifice all your lands you don't need them anymore so you can just keep cycling through your deck and creating endurance triggers netting green blue mana as you go like that's how you get infinite mana that's how you start and it's not a big deal if you're like a little pinched on mana early on in the this process because endurance is also a free spell that goes to the graveyard so you can if you don't have quite enough mana for Endurance yet, but you do have the Sylvan Safekeeper, you can um, pitch cast the Endurance, just evoke it. Any You're going to have a million green cards in your hand because Nada goes through your deck. So you just pitch one of those, put uh, Endurance into play, stack the triggers such that Endurance goes to the graveyard before you shuffle your graveyard back. So you want to shuffle Endurance back into your library so you can draw it again. Uh, and then keep going through your deck with the, the shit. The, uh, the insect and the shuko triggers and the nadus and all that stuff and eventually you'll redraw the endurance and you'll be able to cast it by then so that's how we get infinite mana. okay <laughs> yeah that's infinite mana it's not a win condition quite yet but infinite mana step one it's not a win condition but you've got infinite mana and once you do that a few times you can just say to your opponent okay this is this is infinite mana do we agree about that i have a, a million green a million blue uh you can get blue without a war out but you cannot get it with basically any other land that most lists play uh, because mm -hmm. all of the blue lands going to be tapped like a hedge maze or breeding pool you don't really you can't really pay infinite two life uh, and you're not going to have access to white mana because these lists usually only play like a lush portico or a temple garden or something like that it's another coming to play tapped white land so you're, you're going to have yeah. as much green as you want because of yavimaya uh, and as much blue as you want because of odawar but you're not going to have any other color. So once you've established you have infinite blue and green, you get to the, the fun stuff. So the way these like conventional channel land work, lands loops work is that because you're not, you don't have a Thassa's Oracle or a win condition in your deck, you're just making it so your opponent can't win. Uh, and the reason these decks play the channel lands is to just minimize the amount of deck space it takes. So Besaju and Odor are kind of free includes, so you can just win the game with those. The trick is figuring out how to channel them. Because Nadu is not an optional trigger. W once it reveals the top card, it puts a land into play if it's a land. So if you were to just reveal an Odor, it's not like you can opt to put that card into your hand. You have to put it into play. Mm -hmm. Which means you have to get a little creative with your stacking triggers and waterlogged growth stuff so step one is infinite mana we've got infinite mana uh, and i want the board you can construct the board state from there as you want because you can draw through your deck a lot so the board state you want to get to is you have an empty library all your lands are in play Odo endurance is an intuko you know all already on the battlefield and there's an endurance trigger on the stack or copy trigger on the stack it doesn't really matter you basically just want to be able to respond to an endurance trigger that you're about to put your lands back into your library, right? Or your graveyard back into your library. So you want to sacrifice your waterlogged grove and any land, it really doesn't matter, to the safekeeper. That'll shuffle those back in. You do not know the order of that, which is important because you can't just say you're going to sacrifice Odawara and grove because if you flip Odawara first, you just can't do that. You can't declare an infinite loop where the outcome is not certain. That's a four horseman type loop, which is a really old legacy deck. 
involving like milling your whole deck, but you have an Emrakul. So theoretically, at one point, Emrakul will not get milled and you'll just stop when it's the last card in your library, which works, you know, mathematically. But in game sense, you can't just tell your opponent, you have to have an exact number of times you're performing this loop. So that's why you're sacrificing the Grove. And I usually sacrifice a fetch land because it's just easier to explain. So Grove and fetch in the library, let the endurance trigger resolve, and then those go back in the, the, uh, the library. Then you're going to trigger, or sorry, sacrifice the Odawara to trigger the value. You want to do Odawara first. You want to do all your Odawara loops first and then your Basaju loops because Basaju can give them mana. He fetches lands out of their deck. So you just want to pick up all their stuff first and then start killing all their lands. So to clarify, when you say pick up all their stuff, you mean with the, with Odawara? the Odawara channel? We haven't quite channeled an Odawara yet, but the order of operations for like winning the game is you want to bounce all of their odawara permanence and then besage you all of their besage you permanence, which will leave them in play with just basic basics. Lands. Yeah. So your library is Grove plus Mystery Land plus Fetch Land. Uh, you're going to sacrifice the Odawara to Safekeeper. That's going to trigger Nadu and put a land into play. You don't know what it is. It could be either Grove or the Fetch. So that's going to that land's going to come into play and trigger the uh, Nantuko on the Endurance, which you're going to make a copy of. And then that Odawara is going to go on the bottom of the deck. So your library is now the first land you put back that you... Now you know what it is. It's either a Grove or a Fetch. And the bottom card of your library is Endurance. Or sorry, the bottom card of your library is Odawara. Mm -hmm. So you now do it again. You put that land in play. Now Grove is definitely in play. There's no question about it. And the bottom card, the only card of your deck is Odawara. Mm -hmm. And you have a, a landfall trigger from the uh, the Grove entering the play. So you want to sacrifice the Grove, draw the Odawara, and then immediately channel the Odawara to bounce one of their things. How are you drawing the Odawara? With the Waterlog Grove. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so once you have the Grove in play, you and you know the top card, of your, the only card in your deck is Odawara, you want to sacrifice the water to, to draw the Odawara, channel the Odawara, that will, you know, it bounces one of their things. Then your graveyard is Odawara and the Grove, and you can copy Endurance because the, the Grove is on the, the Grove trigger is still on the stack for the, the Endurance copy. So you copy Endurance, you put those two lands back, uh, you can Shuko twice again. You have a billion bugs in play, by the way. Every every time you put a land into play, you get a bunch of bugs. Mm -hmm. So now do those two lands back into play, those the Waterlord Grove and the uh, Odawara. Then pay to copy Endurance, and then you're just back where you started. You've got Endurance trigger on the stack, you have an empty library, and an empty graveyard. So you're good to keep doing that as many times as you want. And then once you're done odawara you just switch to this issue. So by the time you pass turn, their their hand their uh, field is all basics. You have just a bajillion insects into play, a truly uncountable number of insects, mm -hmm. and a deck full of whatever you want because you'll you'll go to you'll go to clean up and discard a bunch of stuff. You can endurance those cards back as well, uh, and then they do whatever they can with their turn. It's usually not much because they only got basics, and then you attack. So I see. So you have to pass back in this loop. Yes. In theory, you could then lose to Force of Despair. You could, but they would have almost certainly Force of Despair before you achieved infinite mana. Because Force of Despair sure. only works for the cards that entered the battlefield that turn, I believe. Sure. Oh, I see. So, so you, they, in theory, you would have to Force of Despair on the Nadu player's end step. Yes, to board. that is correct. Okay. Uh, it's also not something you really have to do against. Like, a, you can do this. The only the only deck I know that plays Force of Despair is the Necrodominance deck, right? And I find that matchup is not really about comboing as much as it is stopping your opponent from having Necrodominance, and the rest of their deck doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. So so okay. So let's not say Force. Let's say a more common card, Wrath of the Skies. Yep. A control player could two in planes, theory then they could in theory wrath, just yeah. Wrath your whole board away, which is a problem. Uh huh. Uh, a lot of lists do not have two planes, though. So this is not possible for many, many Jeskai decks. They usually only have one of each basic. Uh, mm -hmm. But it is relevant 
especially in Dadu mirrors. If your opponent has three basics, uh, and that's, or sorry, excuse me, four basics, they could theoretically go Nadu Shuko and then try to win. It's unlikely, but they could do it. Uh, basically, all of these things that you do have to pass turn and you have to win afterwards, it, it's true, but a lot of decks just can't win after that. Like, theoretically they could, but they're really not going to. And because Endurance is part of your your thing, and you've drawn your whole deck, let's say that Jeskai has the two planes and has the Wrath of the Skies, uh, and you want to end your turn, you know, your looping turn, you want to make sure you can copy Endurance, which means having a fetchable land in your library and a fetch land available to you, so you can fetch and then copy the Endurance at instant speed. So you, you can control what your library is that way, because you discard a bunch of cards end of turn, you can sacrifice your lands however you want, and your hand is going to be copies of Nadu and Shuko, and so on. Mm -hmm. So if they take the time to, with their two planes and like an island or whatever, whatever basics they actually have in their deck, if they want to take the time to kill all your stuff, you're just going to redeploy everything and put a million stuff into play again. So like, yeah. you're not winning, air quotes, but I don't see how you're not winning after that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that makes sense. Um, and and this is basically the loop that we also saw on display at the Pro Tour. Yes. Right. This when is the same when one. Sam Sam party in the finals, mm -hmm. rocking and rolling. Cool. There's more. There's not really more. That's the main one. You can spice okay. it up with a few extra cards if you want to try to win on the spot. Uh, Bruce Lee Bill is one of my favorites because this is. If you're not familiar, it's a two drop from OTJ with landfall, put a plus one, one counter on target creature. Uh -huh. So this allows you to both, it's kind of like a bridge card. It can trigger Nadu with a land drop, just like Springheart and Ichigo kind of can. It's kind of a Springheart and Ichigo, but it also mm -hmm. kind of kills them because if you have creatures that can attack, you can just start putting infinite plus one, plus one counters on them and then attacking with them. Like that, that is a way you can just win the game with a card that is a bridge card, right? It's not a dedicated kill card. Gotcha. Cool. And that's that's kind of the loop, really. Uh, when, and we talked about this on our cast, but usually when the, uh, the Nadu player has two Springheart and two goes and hits a land, I'm out of there, I'm done. They can explain to me how they want to kill me, but I... As long as they can explain it well enough, I'm not going to force them to do it. It takes a pretty it, long time to do the loop. It, it takes forever. And like unlike Magic Online, where we have chess clocks, in paper, if you force someone to go through it manually, you, like at best, might force a draw, right? Because yeah. you go to time, blah, blah, blah. Well, at, or best, even if you go, at best, they you go to time, and then they have five turns. understand how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because yes. the Waterland Growth thing is not super intuitive. The first few tournaments I played Nadu at... Uh, playing the mirrors, my opponent was like, yeah, I'll just draw it with the water of the grove. And I'd be like, okay, how are you doing that? And they just yeah. couldn't figure it out. I had one opponent who just couldn't figure it out. So he just yeah. passed turn with a million bugs, and then I killed him. <laughs> with your own knock. Yeah, with my own knock. Gotcha, gotcha. Because he, he couldn't loop his stuff, so he didn't know how to stop me from doing his stuff. Okay. Um, all right, cool. And then the, I guess the other one was Finale of Devastation, right? Just to like produce infinite mana, get something out of your library, give it plus a million, plus a million mm -hmm. in haste. Yep, and then just attack for lethal. Finale, Thassa's Oracle, and this, like, the Se and the Seiju looping thing. Those are, like, the three main ways you kill. And that's that's kind of naughty. Like, is <laughs> I know it's a lot, and the main thing is just explaining how you are stacking lands in your library and drawing your Odawara before you... Like, you've got to know that before you try to do it. Because you could just kill yourself or find yourself in an endless, like, an unbounded horseman loop where you just, like, are doing actions kind of at random and you're not really sure where you're going. That will cause you to just, like, st brain malfunction and just, like, exit the tournament. Like, you don't want to be in that spot. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, this is great. This is great. I feel even more prepared than before. I'm not playing Nadu, but <laughs> but now at least I know when I can maybe save myself a little bit of time. And I'm telling. If you don't want to make the Nadu player play it out, 
once they've got two spring heart and two goes in play and you can't interact with them you should just head to the next one it, it almost sounds though that like i don't know if this is genius or grifter but if they say well i'm going to draw it with my waterlogged grove ask them how and force them to explain that they understand the waterlogged grove interaction and if they can then you're probably better off just moving on yeah i would also only ask that if i had a feasible way to win the next turn because nadu is not really going to be like if they if they if you make them explain it and they don't quite get it or they don't know how to explain it or they don't do it right and you're thinking maybe oh this person doesn't know how to do it you then have to think if we go to my next turn am i beating ten thousand bugs <laughs> like am i because a lot yeah. of decks the answer is no yeah yeah um and and i guess the other thing you can also do is if your opponent ex is presenting a loop to you you could ask a judge to to stand by to ensure that they're accurately explaining the board state and the loop yes just to make sure there's no funny business if if you're not confident in their explanation I mean, especially if you're not playing out of yourself you never played it it's always advisable just like have a judge watch make sure everything that's he's saying or they're saying is happening is what yeah. is happening yeah cool all right well lee thank you so much yeah. this this was enlightening um uh i'm glad i was able to get this out of you instead of letting chris get it out of you because it's it's very valuable information i think yeah. at least for the next few weeks but people are going to be playing rcqs they're not going to be ghost towns and oh now our, maybe... our rcq last weekend had so many players i was shocked like mm -hmm. especially coming off of pioneer which was a ghost town basically itself uh everyone just loves playing modern and th that's i'm seeing it like we had very few dadu players as it, they kind of expected no one's gonna buy the cards or anything but i mean i was one of them i'm gonna be one of them again this weekend i'm not not playing this deck not is fantastic <laughs> what, what were you losing to Nadu. because assuming, assuming you did not win darcy <laughs> just the mirror yeah, yeah the mirrors are kind of weird because some games you like both have interaction and you like get to play a weird cat and mouse game where you're like right, how am i going to force this person to use their haywire might versus my kind of uh volatile storm drake court mm -hmm. and then some games one player has interaction you lose and some games the other player just has uh the stone cold nuts with backup and you lose through your own interaction so like it's kind of die roll dependent the nadu decks are very good so it's just kind of what you're signing up for well, best of luck in your tournament. Thanks. I'm I'm excited to hear it on the show. Yeah, what are you playing? After you've won. I'm a I'm Borosin. Okay. I like I like me some I'm I'm a big Mardu pill now, but I do like the I, I know the evolutions of Boros a lot. Yeah, oh I I'm I'm bombardment pilled. Yeah, bombardment. And I was awesome. especially after hearing you guys talk with some trepidation about Boros's position, which I respectfully disagree with. I think that the deck is incredible and i've been beating nadu online just because if you win the coin flip you can outrace them i think sometimes without a problem regardless <laughs> bombard bombardment's the truth like yeah, so, so good, good in the mirror so good against the one ring um and just it does a lot of work it also flips your your necker dominance match up to like extremely favored <laughs> is, is that right yeah. just because they go to like yeah, they, no like, life yeah, and then how are you gonna they have bombardment in play well how much life are you gonna pay <laughs> well, <you know? laughs> I love that. All right. Well, till next time, Lee. Hopefully next time you're on the dive down, it's for the full episode. But until then, this was Learning Loops with Lee McLeod. Yeah. Until, until next time, there's a 14-step combo deck. <laughs> All right. First, make infinite libraries. Shoot. And you're speaking my language. You get some split screens up in here? Yeah. That's an unstable card. All right, Sam, well, thanks for that interview. I haven't heard it yet, but I've definitely learned a lot about <laughs> Nadu loops via osmosis that will help out in the RCQs that I have coming up. And I hope that helps everybody else coming up. Look, this new era that we are in in modern, mm -hmm. thanks to MH3, I, we've talked about how fastidious I try to be about my magic card collection. Oh, before, God. Right? My thought of control again. Mm-hmm. 
right so i have a box for every color every card is organized every card i might play in any format is organized alphabetically they are all in mtg goldfish so i can track them as a database yada 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 well friends with the advent of modern horizons 3 i finally decided that it was time to have a real hard look at myself and look at what cards i had been carrying for the last four or five Uh years in my quote unquote constructed playable (laughs) area that uh need to be moved out and i have a box i'm gonna hold it up for you it is a 900 count box yeah of cards that i removed from all of my colors it's in a box that says retired cards (laughs) now that i have to figure out what to do with them at this point so technically you've not removed them you've just moved them to a new box with a different label they no longer are in my database Uh okay they are now returning to bulk at best and some of them might go back into the just commons boxes that i have but what i thought would be fun is if you guys could try guessing what these cards are based on clues. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the card color and the casting cost first. I okay, love it. I'm getting scribe. Then, then I will give you the set, Ooh, set. And, and the card type. And then we will figure out from there where to go. We'll start working through lines of the card text from there. I vote that Shane close the Scryfall. Oh yeah. I'm closing Scryfall now. Yeah. Okay. okay. So some of these cards are cards that we've talked about. Some of these cards have personal meanings to us. Some of these cards are cards that never quite got there. Some of these cards are Celestial Colonnade. That's right. That's right. (laughs) Actually, I don't think I took Celestial Colonnade out, and I should have, now that you mention it. Uh, But here's, here's the first one, for example. This is a blue card. It's a generic and a blue. It is a creature. Okay, Phantasmal Image. Okay, Shane's guess is fantastic. No, it's not my guess. I'm just saying that's what it is. I mean, that's what that's an option. I thought you were also telling a set. The set is M21. Okay. Oh, sorry, M20. M20. One in the blue. My goodness, and something Dave would like. Man, I don't even remember what's in M20. M20 is a good set. It is a creature merfolk pirate. Oh. The one that gets plus one plus one counters when you it, it's blood it's the cutthroat it's like yep the, brian born cutthroat yeah yeah <laughs> a card that stan and i have both tried to play at a nerd rage gaming event and both went oh four i believe was it, it like, or something is it like, like vaguely that. prowessy like it gets counters on it or something like it that? is it is a flash two one with whenever you cast a spell during an opponent's turn put a plus one plus one counter on brian mm, Ward, yes cutthroat. yes good, i wanted good, to say good guess dan i wanted to say like bloodborne cutthroat but i knew that wasn't it bloodborne cutthroat it's okay a, i'm shuffling a, the a future deck. a future episode of our gaming podcast Danislav. <laughs> buttons on the ding dong yeah Oof, you've got wow. a P, you've got a ps4 and i want to play bloodborne again remind me to sleep through that one okay <laughs> here's here's a new card for you it is three generic, red, red. It is a dragon. Okay. This is easy once I tell you this set. I'm just going to leave it at three generic, red, red. It's a dragon. It's a 4-4. Four, four. Stormbreath dragon. It is Stormbreath dragon. Play that before your attack phase. Yeah, play it before your attack phase in standard in particular. You know, people tried this a little bit in modern at different points in time. They also tried the, uh, the other one, the one, uh, what's it called, Thunderwing? the one that taps flyers mm. and does one damage to things so you could get through so you could get through um oh god what's the card lingering souls tokens was a a moment in modern oh time oh my gosh yeah okay we'll do a few more of these you guys feeling good this is I mean, the best got, part of the episode we're, so we're, far we're two out of two baby you guys are doing great all right i got one for you here i'm not going to tell you too much about it it is a gold card and it costs x white blue blue Oh, Sphinx's, uh, Revelation. Sphinx's Revelation. Good job. Yep. Sphinx's Revelation gone from my box finally after wow. you know, I'm surprised it was still nine years of not being viable and modern. Yeah. Stan's look is how are you tracking? Why were you tracking these cards for so long? Like that card was bad by the time Modern Horizons 1 came out. Like, yes. It, it, yeah, it, it, it hasn't been playable in so long. It was printed in Modern Masters, what, 2019? 
or not 2019, Modern Masters 3, whatever that was, 2017. I literally don't think it was seeing play when we started this podcast. It wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't. But it, but I played it in Modern, one of my first Jeskai control deck that I had. All right, here's one for you. You had it's to a little... not lose somehow. Yeah, exactly. Well, Celestial Colonnade is how you didn't lose. No, that's how All you right, here's... won, but yeah, go on. that's true. Here's the next one. It is a creature, two generic and a green. It is a human scout. Um, oh, Tireless Tracker. Oh, my man. Dan nailed it. Tireless Tracker is the card. Say goodbye to Tireless Tracker, Modern, and Pioneer as well. Remember, these are, these are cards I also don't think are playable in Pioneer. My guess was Duskwatch Recruiter. But he's that's not a generic a, and a green. Yes, he is not a werewolf. I mean, excuse me. He is not a he, scout. He is that's a werewolf. Right. All right. Let's see. What else do we got here? Here's one. Here's one for, for Stan at Stan's heart. This is a card that also was not playable when you started playing modern Stan, but let's see if you can nail it. It is an instant, and it costs a generic, a blue, and a red. Is it charm? Uh, is it charm costs just a blue and a red? Oh, you're right. Ionize? Not, not oh, ionize. Electrolyze? It's electrolyze. Yeah. Yep. Electrolyze. Good job, Shane. Okay. You know what? That card was good when we started the podcast. It was, was it? You, you uh, could play it against humans in like uh, old Blue Moon decks. Yep. Before Phoenix pushed Blue Moon out of the format. Well, this is a card that I loved when I first started playing Modern, for sure, and was always like hanging around in sideboards. And uh, yeah, there it is. Goodbye. Took them all out of my out of my set. Yeah. Okay. I have a generic and a white for an instant. And I will tell you the set it's in. The set it's in is Eldritch Moon. Ooh. Oh, it's the removal spell. It's a sorcery. Oh, no, it's an instant. Oh. I was going to guess like Valorous Stance or something. Generic and a white instant from Eldritch Moon. It, and is, is it the thing that like exiles a creature and all creatures with the same name no uh i don't know man let's see all right i'm gonna go, go further it is an uncommon mm -hmm. very helpful it has escalate oh 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 that one that like can it kill an attacking creature or like gain you for life or something like that yep it is blessed alliance wow that's an instant escalate <laughs> two Target player gains four life, untap up to two target creatures, or target opponent sacrifices an attacking creature. My friends, I had seven of these in my collection <laughs> just in, in case. Goldfish for some reason. Just in, yeah, case. just in case. I had seven of these set aside in my box. Uh, well, you guys want to do two more? Sure. I got yes. a whole stack. I got this many. <laughs> oh, man. Let's just do this for the next episode. Okay. People love it. Here's the first one that is a colorless card. It is two generic and a colorless mana mm -hmm. for a creature mm. that I am moving. Mimic? It's not Mimic. No, Mimic's two. And yeah, Mimic, Mimic, Mimic would two. stay in your box, I feel like. Yes, I would keep Mimic around. Two and a colorless for an Eldrazi creature or colorless creature. This is, this is interesting. If it's two and a colorless, it has to be an Eldrazi. I don't think yeah, there's any it would like... be generic, yeah. Yeah. This is a this is a tough one because I What's I that? can't think of oh 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 matter no matter shaper it is matter shaper yes ah. matter shaper goodbye matter shaper I had five of these in my collection set aside for some reason do you remember all the spilled ink over whether or not Etron should play that card <laughs> yes. yes 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 it would never yep. stop well it has stopped now all right I have two cards left that I would let. Yeah, two I would like to do out of this. <laughs> just, just keep this adding more. I'm just going to keep adding more. All right, this one is two generic and a black. Hero's Downfall. It is a rare creature. <laughs> okay, creature. It is a 3-2. Murderous Rider. No. That's generic Good black, black. Yeah. Two generic and a black for a rare creature? Yep. Two and a black for a rare creature. Is it the Liliana that flips? No, she's like only one, I think. From Magic Origins? I think she's one black black, too, is she not? Mm. I think she's just like, I think she's even cheaper. But it's not her, so. It's not her. All right, I'm going to give you the first line of text on it. It has Devoid. 
Mm. That should tell you what you need to know about the creature type. Okay, one. Okay, so it's so it's an Eldrazi. Oh, 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 um, oh. Is it the one that moves things from exile yeah, into it, your graveyard? Oh, 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 I know who it is. It's it's Con, the it's the conscriptor. No, it's the. Uh, oh crap! He's got such a good name too. Eldrazi like, processor or something. Yeah, he's a processor. That's what type it's, he is. He's yeah. an Eldrazi processor. Man, the, one of the best card names of all time. They always made fun of it. I'm one of my old favorite Magic podcasts. It doesn't exist anymore. What is it, Dave? Wasteland Strangler. Strangler. <laughs> the Strangler. So one of the first other like well, after I had my first decks in modern, one of the next decks I got was. Black, white, Eldrazi, and Taxes. And this card was in that deck at one point in time. Cool card. You can do some really okay. cool stuff with it. I think I'm going to go with, for the last card here, one of my least favorite cards that I have ever played. Mm. And it is a creature that costs a generic and a red. Whoa. That's not your favorite. It's one of my oh. most hated cards. Okay. And this is a modern box, potentially. I mean... Okay. And did you actually play it? I don't think I ever played it in paper. I played it online in modern. Is it, is it that bad Snapcaster pirate from no, the original although I did, I did take that out of my box, too. So that, that card is here. Okay. You don't like it, and you, you've potentially tried to play it. It's probably not the wizard that gets stuff out of the graveyard. Um, it is a human monk. It is a 2-1. Abbot of Carol Keep. Abbot yeah. of Carol Keep. It's Abbot of Carol yes. Keep. Thank you. That's the one I was Goodbye. trying to figure out. Goodbye, Abbot of Carol Keep. All right. So that was my game that that's, I've been hyping that, for that's forever. A, that's a good game. I'll I'll accept the win since I guess the last one. Yeah, though. you got it. I'll give it Sh to you. Shane got more I along the way. I can see. I can see it early. Exactly to preserve information about how much you know. Yes. So next, so next time we do this, next round, I have I have an advantage. <laughs> <laughs> well this was fun look at us look at us having fun like old friends yeah I'm, I'm smiling if you're smiling too and you want to smile more subscribe to our podcast so you get the latest episodes as soon as they come out and if you use Apple Podcasts or Spotify please leave us a rating and review if you'd like to submit a question to our podcast you can tweet us at the dive down all one word or email the dive down at gmail.com. If you want to support the show, you can join our Patreon at patreon.com slash the dive down or through our e-commerce experience at the dive down.com slash store. Head over to heavyplay.com to get some incredible deck and dice boxes and play mats featuring the equip mag system. Use promo code the dive down 2024 to get 10% off your first order at heavy play. Also, shout out to Mana Traders for sponsoring the Dive Down. If you sign up for Mana Traders with our exclusive promo code, you'll get 10% off your first two months of renting Magic Online cards. Take a look at the show notes of the most recent Dive Down episode to see what the current promo code is there. As always, special thanks to the bands Nowhere and Spaceblood for letting us use their music. And until next week, get out there and scoop less mull. Mo Can you uh, retake that for me? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay.